so now I'll be looking at uh, life cycle data management. So this is just a, you could almost say a grab bag of topics which they have just collectively put together under life cycle data management. So essentially here what we see is that every product has a life cycle and you know the information, uh, you need to keep some information, track some information consistently over the life cycle of the product and there are some features in SAP that support some of these things. I did. Yes. Not I, yeah, I put it up just a couple of hours ago. Okay. So uh, one important aspect of any of these kinds of system is document management. Right? We keep talking about documents in many of the other modules, but you need some way by which the system can store documents and also connect documents to various parts of SAP. So for example, uh, you should be able to take a document, a scanned document, for example, which is sitting inside in some area of SAP and connect it to any of the master data. Okay, uh, so for for example, you receive an invoice in the mail and you entered the invoice, but you also want to keep a copy of the electronic invoice somewhere in the system and be able to let's say connect from the corresponding accounting transaction to the actual invoice. Okay, so you have these kinds of requirements or uh, you're doing something uh, with respect to engineering, there's an engineering drawing and you need to be able to go from the material to its drawing, right? So navigate from the material to the drawing. So these kinds of things, all of that is supported within the document management aspect of SAP, which we'll be looking at shortly. Then another set of things is what is called product structure management. Okay, just, just convenient ways by which you can look at the bill of material and the routing for a product easily. Okay, that is product structure management and also uh, in any of these companies, you make engineering changes, right? You make changes to the design of the product, changes to some specification, changes to routings, or changes to the bomb, to the bomb and things like that. And these changes, of course, have lots of implications, uh, down, downstream implications for how things are produced and all kinds of things, right? So you want to make, uh, make sure that you're able to make these changes in a controlled way and track the changes as well. Okay, so that whole aspect of it is called engineering change management, um, which is also included here. That is the last part here. Engineering change and configuration management. Product sector management is just, you know, management of bombs and routings and materials and other documents and all that in an integrated way, right? Because as of now, we are seeing that all of these things are lying all over the place. And right now we can look at them independently through various master data. But they're all obviously related things, related to a product, for example, or related to a material. You need some mechanism by which you can look at all of them in one place. Okay, that is what this aspect is. We'll be looking at that. Uh, and then, of course, integration of various computer-aided CAX, you know, CAD-CAM kind of systems to SAP. Because after all, in SAP, you're dealing with manufacturing. But the actual design of the product is done using some CAD CAM systems. SAP has not got into that arena yet. Okay, no, they probably will not get into that arena. It's too specialized. But you need a way by which you can connect from your SAP ERP system to those other systems. Right, so the drawings and things like that, engineering specifications may be created in an outside system, but you may want to connect that to SAP. Okay, and probably exchange data in both directions. So that is the uh, integration with computer-aided uh, CAD CAM design and manufacturing systems. Right? So these are all the various components that we'll be talking about in this chapter. Okay, so document management is integration of external files into SAP, right? So here you see here uh, some of the external files may be things like a numerically controlled program. You know, you've got a lot of numerically controlled machines that are used in manufacturing. So the programs for those machines are obviously digital software, which may be kept inside your SAP system. And then through some connection, you can upload those programs to the machines as and when needed, so that those machines execute those programs. So you've got those. Uh, so you've, you've got scanned documents like contracts and so on. Okay, so you've got all of these sorts of documents that you may create. 
okay, it's from external systems and you want to connect it to your SAP system, the main conduit for this connection is your document info record. Okay, so document info record is the one that has a linkage to the actual document and it has all the information necessary about the actual document and it is the document info record that you will connect to various SAP objects like materials and anything. It doesn't matter. You can connect a document to any SAP object. Okay, so that's the idea and by their definition a document is the combination of the document info record and the original document. I'm assuming this is what they mean by the original document, whatever. It's a combination of the document info record and the original document. Together, that is what is called document in SAP. Right? And of course, original document we are talking about is the scanned or otherwise electronic version of the document that is kept in SAP. And these documents, of course, have uh, you know security issues involved. You can't place certain documents for everybody to see. So that management of that security is also part of the SAP system. So you can keep these documents in secure storage areas and control accessibility through usual access controls. You know, only people who are allowed to see those documents will be able to navigate to those documents. So that mechanism is available. Okay. So this, like I said earlier, the document info record is the conduit. By conduit, I mean it's the connection between the various SAP objects and the actual document. Okay. Now, once you have created this link, access controls exist like I had said earlier. Once you have created the link of connecting the document info record to SAP objects, after that, you can navigate directly from the SAP object to the documents. You don't have to then go through the document info record. The purpose of this is only to establish that connection. Once the connection is established, you can go directly from SAP objects to the documents. Okay, so the document info records have various functions. Uh, they support uh, version management, status management, classification, we'll be talking about it shortly, and secure storage areas, which I just spoke about. So uh, they support all of these things. Uh, and within SAP, when you connect a document uh, info record to an SAP object, that's called as an object link. So that is what it allows. And the document info record also has PLM interface. PLM interface is what is used for uh, external systems. They call it the PLM or product lifecycle management interface through which you can connect to, you know, design systems, for example. And the document can then be a file in the design system. The design of a product as created in a design system. Yeah. The object link, does it connect the on the previous slide? Is that the connection between like your material equipment? Yeah, that's the object link. That's the this is the object link. Okay. All of these are object links. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there is this thing called as the ECL viewer in Microsoft Office integration, which is again top part of the integration scheme whereby you can actually display and process the originals uh, from within SAP or of course you can handle them out in the original programs also. Okay, and there are a couple of options here for how this can be achieved as well. Okay, and then you have this thing called as the uh, easy DMS interface, right? Easy way to view and change the objects without specialized knowledge and without SAP GUI. We'll see this aspect also shortly. You mean the you mean the expansion for ECL? Yeah, well, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So we are just showing here that you can link document info records to pretty much anything within SAP. Okay. So any any SAP thing can be connected to a document info record. <coughs> Okay. We have already seen this, you can link them and once you have linked them, you can navigate without actually having to view the document info record and the linkage is possible from both sides. So from a document, you can go to you know, all the SAP objects to which it is linked and from an object, you can go to the document to which it is linked. So it's bi direction and it's not a one directional link. <coughs> and as I've already said, once you have linked it, you can go directly. You don't have to look at the document info record. 
Okay. So this is the PLM interface for data transfer, product lifecycle management interface. And usually you can link to many things because it's after all, all of these linkages are probably just protocols. Any program that can speak the protocol can actually link to SAP, but it's typically linked to these kinds of programs, right? So computer aided engineering, computer aided design systems, geographical information systems, GIS, uh, office applications, and classification systems. We'll talk about classification systems here. Uh, SAP has a classification system, but sometimes it's possible that a particular company may not be using SAP's classification system, right? It's, it's a specialized piece of software and there are in fact companies which specialize in just building classification systems. So you may think that the third party classification system is better than your SAP classification system, in which case you can connect to that. Okay, so these are all the different uh, kind of programs to which you connect. Okay, here we are taking a slightly closer look at the PLM interface, right? It allows you uh, online connection between SAP and third party applications. In other words, let's say you've got a computer aided uh, design program that you're running and you've got your SAP running. So this shows you a live connection between those two, between SAP and the computer aided design program. Okay, so and it allows bidirectional uh, data interchange. So you can extend data from this system to uh, the CAD CAM system, from SAP to the CAD CAM system and get data from the CAD CAM system into SAP as well. So it allows for bidirectional. So will there be any automatic updates like uh, if you're doing a design modification using a CAD software? You can set it up such that there is automatic thing or if you don't want to do that, you can set it up and manually do the update as well. Okay. They try to make these linkages as seamless as possible. Okay. And uh, there are several technologies for communication between the two things. You know, uh, you just have to know the names of some of these things. It could appear in a question, right? RFC is a remote function call. It's a common protocol for programs to communicate with each other. And uh, BAPI is also something you may see a lot. Uh, this is the business API of SAP. Essentially, SAP at least originally was not written in Java. It was written using their own ABAP programming language, right? But at some point in time, Java became really popular. Everything in the world was Java. So you had a way by which you needed to have a way by which somebody who's writing a Java application could connect to SAP and get things done, right? So for example, I'm writing a Java program for something. Uh, I might need to have a sales order created in SAP, right? So from my Java program, I should have some way by which I can directly connect to SAP and get work done inside it. Okay. The portion of SAP that allows you to do that is what is called BAPI, Business API of SAP. Right. So you write your Java program. Within the Java program, you can make various uh, calls and that will cause things to happen inside your SAP system. Okay. Now gradually what SAP has done is increased its uh, usage of Java and it has complete seamless connection with Java because that's the uh, big language these days. Okay, so uh, essentially those are the two protocols used for communicating between uh, SAP system and the other system. Uh, you can function, that is all of this PLM interface, it can function with the SAP GUI or without the SAP GUI. Right, so it, that is in other words, you can make the SAP GUI transparent to this whole process, right? In which case, uh, let's say you've got uh, your program, you're working in some program and from that program, you need to communicate to SAP, right? But the SAP GUI may not even be visible at that point, right? The SAP, it, it can connect directly from the program itself to SAP and any kind of data transfer that needs to take place uh, can take place seamlessly. At worst, it may have to pop up a couple of dialogues into which the user enters information and off it goes behind the scenes and connects to SAP. Okay, so you've got those two modes in which it can function. Functioning without a GUI, without the SAP GUI or functioning with the SAP GUI. In other words, what you can do then is from inside of SAP, you can do various things that manipulate that program from inside of SAP. Okay, so both bidirectional uh, data transfer is possible. So it's possible for you to work in both directions there. Okay, 
so these are all the various features of the PLM. Uh, now essentially from an exam point of view, you know, you just have to check off these points. Bidirectional, PLM, BAPI, RFC, uh, with GUI, without GUI. Okay, just, just remember all those things and have a very crude sort of an understanding. That should be sufficient. Okay, we've spoken about this. When working without the GUI, SAP just behaves like a database server. It's, you know, the GUI, SAP remains hidden. Uh, in this case, SAP is visible and the user you know, works from SAP. <clears throat> okay, and we spoke about this. Standard interfaces like this and the Java connector. Okay, so that's about the PLM interface and SAP's connection to external systems. Now we move on to a different topic, a completely different topic really, and that is the whole classification system within SAP. Okay, and as the slide shows, uh, the basic intent is within SAP you've got all kinds of objects sitting around, lots of objects. Now currently how do we search within SAP for objects? We get these search screens and we enter some criteria in the search screen and we get the information, right? Classification system is an alternative to that, okay? So that's the idea. But right now all the search screens that we use uh, almost exclusively are uh, limited to searching for objects of one type, right? So you go and search for sales orders and you enter various criteria but what you're looking for are sales orders, sales order. right? Or purchase orders, all objects of one type. But it's possible that you may be looking for <coughs> objects of different type that satisfy certain criteria, right? A very generic kind of search. That's what the classification system enables. Okay. Um, so it supports searching for objects by attributes of the object rather than knowing the number of the object, knowing the object number. Okay. So for example, <coughs> let's just give, I want to give you a really broad overview of how this classification works and the central concept there in classification of course is the concept of a class. Okay, so here we, I'm just considering to be consistent with the example given in the slides. Let's say there is a class called paint. Okay, class is just some kind of a group or category or type. Okay, there is a class called paint and this paint class has two attributes called color and gloss let's say okay so this color is just a textual attribute it can be things like red green blue yellow orange etc <coughs> and gloss is just a, a boolean field yes or no right so red glossy would be color red gloss yes that would be red glossy okay so you got this class <coughs> as of now this class is just sitting out there all by itself not connected to any sap object okay but now, uh, and these are called characteristics. Okay, another, another different use of the word characteristics, right? So, not characteristics and key figures, but this is characteristics from the classification system point of view, with no connection whatsoever to that other characteristics. Okay, so class has characteristics. <coughs> now, I've got lots of materials, material X, Y, Z, etc. And I can assign, an, in fact, not just materials, any SAP object can be assigned to a class. Okay. So I've assigned the class paint to these three materials. Okay. I was, that means we are saying all of these three are paints. Right. They have characteristics of paints. And therefore, you can assign a value of color and gloss to each of these. Okay, so that's what you can do. So you can say this has color blue, glossy, yes. This has color red, glossy, no. This is color yellow, glossy, yes, etc. Okay, so it's almost like by assigning it to that class, it gets, they get new attributes, for example. Okay, so now once you've done that, uh, you can now search for, you know, when you go and search for, uh, you know, a paint. So you say, I want to search for a paint. That means any object that is connected to the paint class. And then you say, I want this color and I want it to be glossy or not glossy. 
and the system will search and bring out all the matching objects for you. Okay, that's the broad idea. Now, uh, you know, obviously things other than materials can also be assigned to the class paint. You can assign any object to any class. There's no restriction. Okay, it only depends upon how creative you can get in using the system, that's all. There's, it, it doesn't say that the class paint is applicable only to materials. It's possible that you might apply it to anything. Okay, so that's the idea here. And of course, an object can also be assigned to several classes. Right, so a material, you can assign it to class paint. And you may be able to assign material to many other classes as well. Right, so you may have a class called perishability and some information there and you may say you may attach materials to those things okay so class is just a completely different sort of a thing independent of everything else that we've seen so far right so you've got a bunch of classes you allocate any object to any class and then once you do that allocation you can then assign the values for each of the characteristics of those assigned classes and when you search the system is able to give you the matches Okay, so that's the idea here. Here we are just following that up a little bit more with an example of somebody is trying to create a bill of material. Okay, there's a person who's working who's trying to create a bill of material and uh, he or she is looking for a paint. Right, they're searching that, you know, lots of materials are available. They're looking for a paint with certain specific characteristics that they can include in their bill of material. Right. So they say, okay, they're creating the bomb. They've entered the first item. They are into the second item. Okay. And then they say, okay, I want to uh, search for the item. And how do they start the search? They say, okay, show me all the classes. Right. They know that they're looking for, you know, a paint or items through the, they want to start their search through the class paint, not through the usual search for, for materials. Okay, so they say, okay, show me the list of classes, they select paint, and then they say, okay, among the objects that have the paint that are allocated to the paint class, I want to look for those objects who have uh, color blue and gloss, whatever, yes or no, something. Okay, so they give the value for the characteristics that they're looking for. And the system comes back and says, okay, there are these two materials that allow. In fact, the gloss, they didn't put a value. So it gave both with gloss and without gloss. So they said, okay, I don't care about the gloss, but I want only the, all the blue paints. So they got two blue paints out of which they then selected one of them. They just selected the second one. Okay. So here the search was very different from how we are normally used to the search, right? So here the initiation of the search took place from the class, right? And then from the class, they got they were able to drill down, find out, uh, you know, give the matching characteristics. And then the system came and found all the objects that meet your criteria. And then you selected one from those objects. Okay. So this is the broad process of how classification works in SAP, which is very different from, uh, you know, from the normal way of searching. So for example, if you've got a material, a material doesn't have, uh, you know, attributes like color and gloss and things like that, right? And we don't know what kind of attributes you may need tomorrow. So you cannot be adding additional fields to materials just like that. Some materials may require certain fields. Some materials may not require certain fields, right? So you can't go and change the structure of your material master every time you need something special, right? So this classification system is what allows you to flexibly add all these sorts of characteristics. Yeah. Every time you create a material, a material master record, you have to assign the material to all the different classes you want it to belong to, or would it pick up based on the attributes you give the material? So if, if it's a pump that is this displacement or whatever, and you specify that within your material master, you don't now have to go and also assign it to that class. Uh, you'll have to assign it to the class because, uh, see, as far as it's the material is concerned, you've created a material, right? Now, you may call it a pump, but SAP doesn't know it's a pump, right? So, you'll have to assign it. 
you'll have to assign it to whatever classes you think it may belong to. There's no automated mechanism. 